So, good evening. Or good afternoon. So we're back at Richmond Beach City Park in the shoreline, talking about informal fallacies this time. Mm -hmm. so, so we've already introduced the idea of an informal fallacy uh, and distinguished informal fallacies from formal fallacies. We've also defined what a fallacy is, an error in reasoning. And we've talked about a couple informal fallacies. We just want to discuss the concept a little further for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. So my favorite fallacy is the ad hominem fallacy. Uh, and of course, this is when you attack the person rather than their argument or their reasoning. And then on the basis of that personal attack, you attempt to convince people that you've attacked, that you have uh, defeated their reasoning mm -hmm. or their argument. And there are many types of ad hominems. There's, let's discuss a few of the types. There's circumstantial ad hominem, where we attack someone's circumstances and then think that that refutes their argument. What, can you give well, an example? Well, oftentimes the situation is I am claiming you're being, um, you have a vested interest in something. I might say that Senator Jones is advocating uh, that we all vote for wheat subsidies, but Senator Jones is from Kansas, and we all know that if he gets those wheat subsidies, his uh, wheat mm -hmm. farmer um, people are gonna vote for him. Mm -hmm. So he just has a vested interest, so therefore his position on wheat subsidies is bad, we should reject it. That would be an ad a circumstantial yeah. ad hominem. And he may, be, you know, he may have good reasons for voting for wheat subsidies. The mere fact that he is gonna gain something from it, that he's in a circumstance where he gains, doesn't count against it. It doesn't count for it either. What I want to do is find out what his arguments are for wheat subsidies and see if those arguments are good or bad. Right. So, so to engage with him on a rational level is to ignore the circumstantial stuff and focus on his reasoning. Does he have a good argument? Mm -hmm. Does he have some good reasons for his position? And th that's a rational engagement. Right. Uh, another example would be to uh, attack uh, so, uh, a scientist who's advocating nuclear power on the grounds that he's getting paid by the nuclear power industry and therefore his argument's no good or it's not even to be trusted. Yeah, we'd yeah. want to see what his arguments what or his is evidence his for, not the fact that he's being paid by somebody. That by itself doesn't say his arguments are good or bad. Right. It, may, it may make an alarm bell go off in my head to make me take a close look at his arguments. I might be a little more critical of his reasoning, yeah, knowing I, that. But I'd want to look at his reasons, not the mere fact that he gets his paycheck from one person or another. Right. In fact, someone could be being paid by the nuclear power industry, but they still might have a good argument, mm -hmm. independent of that. Mm -hmm. So again, a rational engagement would involve listening to the argument and analyzing the reasoning, uh, independent of any qualms you might have about the paycheck. So another form of ad hominem that's kind of a fun is uh, the tu quoque. Tu quoque means... Are you also, or are you too. You too. So you are, you're another. Yeah. And uh, this, is, this, this happens when someone gives a reason or an argument for a position and then someone replies to them, well, you too. For example, a mother is lecturing her daughter her teenage daughter on the dangers of drug abuse. And the daughter replies, well, you, you used drugs when you were a teenager, as if that refutes the mother's argument. Yeah. That would be a tu quoque, you too. I often hear this uh, offered in such a way where someone says, well, you're just being hypocritical and saying that, therefore your position's false. Mm -hmm. You can be a hypocrite and actually have a good position. The fact that you're a hypocrite may count against your personality, may count against your moral fiber, uh, but even hypocrites could have a good position. Uh, I remember in the first Gulf War, and I'm not going to be over political on this, mm -hmm. but I remember in the first Gulf War some people saying we shouldn't go to, to war uh, against Iraq uh, because just because you know Iraq's an aggressor, we can't go to a war with Iraq, being, they're being an aggressor. We're not going to war with all the other aggressors. We're somehow being hypocritical. We're not being consistent. Therefore, we shouldn't go to war with Iraq. Well, whether we should or shouldn't isn't my issue right here, but it's a lousy argument. The mere fact, even if our government was being somehow hypocritical and going to war with Iraq, but not these other countries that were aggressors, doesn't count, doesn't say anything for or against whether we should have. 
I mean, it's just been an ad hominem argument. And you're talking about 1991. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking specifically of the first one. That's the where I really heard that argument war. a lot. And I thought, well, whether we liked the, that first Gulf War or not, this line of reasoning is really horrible. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, and, a, and a, another analogy would be a smoker yeah. who smokes three packs a day, giving a lecture on the dangers of smoking. Um, one might say, well, you too. In other words, well, you're doing it, so your argument's no good. Right. But actually, his argument might be very good. Even the fact that he's smoking simply means that he's not living in accord with his position. But that doesn't mean his argument isn't any good. Right. So his argument has to be uh, examined on its merits, not on these irrelevant logically irrelevant considerations such as the fact that he's being hypocritical. And this seems to be the favored fallacy of talk radio on both left and the right side of the dial. The two quote I mean, both, Yeah, both, both sides, both liberal conservatives, either side seem to be just loving using this kind of fallacy from time to time. Uh, it's, it's, it's a shame. Well, you know, the, the ad hominem fallacy seems almost ubiquitous in politics, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah. It's just everywhere. Um, well, what fallacy would you call this one? Okay, okay suppose uh, a doctor um, operates on a patient and, and uh, does a terrible job and the patient dies. Okay. And so now the family's quite upset and they're going to sue the doctor. And uh, the doctor says, you know, my wife's sick and my dog just died and I just heard that my grandpa has cancer and they just repossessed my car and towed it away and I just found out our house has termites and I was just uh, diagnosed with tennis elbow and on top of all that our, our cat has feline HIV. Hmm. Now what, what, there's some kind of, something's going on there yeah, but any, what, is any, it an argument? And he concludes on that basis that, that you shouldn't he's not responsible him. for the death of the patient. Or he shouldn't be sued. Shouldn't be sued. Well, this is a real common uh, argument, particularly with some of my students. Uh, we call it appeal to pity. And what, what's happening here is we appeal to this very pitiable and perhaps tragic set of circumstances I, I, I might be in and conclude because I'm in this pitiable, tragic state, therefore such and such should be the case. Now, if my pitiable state is irrelevant to whether such and such should be the case, it's a fallacy. It's, just, it's a fallacy of, of irrelevance. Um, there are times when my pitiable state might be relevant. Mm -hmm. If I say, hey, I'm, I'm dying, I just got in a car wreck, therefore you, as a doctor, should take a look at me very quickly. That That's wouldn't be not a fallacy because pity. my situation is relevant to the conclusion. Mm -hmm. But uh, this doctor who has this, all these horrible things happening to him, that's irrelevant to whether he should or should not be responsible for the death of his patient. So in other words, in the ad misericordium argu uh, uh, fallacy, the appeal to pity, someone is trying to use the feeling of pity, the emotion of pity, to move you to a conclusion when the pitiable state doesn't justify the conclusion, right. yeah. Yeah. logically speaking, mm -hmm. and that makes it a fallacy in error in reasoning. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are some of the interesting, interesting fallacies that you'll read about if you study the logical fallacies, the informal fallacies. There are so many websites on these. There are websites that have hundreds of these cataloged, mm -hmm. these informal fallacies. Again, they're, they're informal because the fallacy cannot be defined purely in terms of the abstract form of the reasoning or the case. Uh, independent of content. Rather, we have to refer to the content, what's being said, and not pure abstract form. So we call these the informal fallacies. Mm -hmm. The formal fallacies, of course, are different. These are fallacies in reasoning that can be defined in terms of pure abstract form or structure without reference to content. So thank you for listening.